crew would go out Friday nights and they would take me with them to a bar. And I wasn't allowed to drink. No one would allow me to. No matter how mad I got, I kicked one guy in the shins with my, Sean, I had a crush on him. I kicked him in the shins with my combat boots and was like, get me a beer. And he's like, no, I'm not getting you a beer because I want to keep my job. And I'm so thankful for that now, right? Like, as mad as I got, like, give me a beer. They would be like, no, I'm not. And um, and I still have some really, really good friends, like my best friends, my son, my oldest son's godparents are the executive producer's assistant and the wardrobe supervisor from Clarissa. So they're still my best friends and they looked out for me and they became like a family and they surrounded me and they protected me. And also I think because there was something about me being the lead where I felt like I was responsible the same way I'm the Mm. oldest of eight kids and I feel responsible. I I have a very serious sense of responsibility and I don't want to disappoint anybody. So I have to memorize those monologues. I have to, you know, show up on set or so-and-so doesn't get to go home to their child for their, you know, big polo match or whatever. Like, I realize this this huge weight that's on my shoulders of like, if you don't show up on time and you don't know your lines and you make everyone wait, that's not only embarrassing, that's super rude. You're just selfish. Like, so I didn't want to be that person. So I think that there was this sense of responsibility that was just infused in me at a young age of doing the right thing and, and and being responsible for myself. And so that carried from Clarissa to Sabrina. And then at Sabrina, I had my mom to protect me. Like all the Me Too movement stuff, of course, when that all happened, everyone's asking me, what's my story? Right. My mom was always right there with me. My mom has a few Me Too movement stories because she ended up you know, getting having meetings with producers that kind of could have gone in bad directions. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two And now she's gonna break down It's a breakdown She's gonna break it down Hi, I'm Ian Bialik And welcome to my breakdown um, Very excited Flying solo today Jonathan is not with us But our guest is enough for a million Jonathans In terms of energy and presence um, Very, very excited to welcome to the breakdown Melissa Joan Hart um, And an incredible resume, and we'll get into all the things. Um, but yes, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and also Clarissa Explains It All. Those are two great references. Um, but this is a woman who has many, many other credits and awesome things to her name. She has a podcast, What Women Binge, which sounds awesome. I just want to binge Melissa Joan Hart all day long. So, <laughs> Melissa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. What a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I don't usually do I don't usually do intros in front of the person largely because I hate when people talk about me in front of me. But since Jonathan isn't here and it's just you and me, I felt like I'm going to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I loved it. I loved it. Um, thank you so much for being here. Of course. I just can't believe we haven't met. We have so much in that's, common. That's what I was going to say. We we really I mean, we're I think a, a year difference in age. Um, but our lives have like kind of been, you know, in parallel aspects of, you know, uh, many iterations of television existence and then having a life beyond what we were known for on television. What years was Clarissa Explains It All? Clarissa was about, I think it was like 89 to 93. Right. So I think that's what I remember is that you were, you know, at that age, I was like, she's younger than me even though it was like a year. Um, But, you know, for us with Blossom, we started, you know, a year or so after. And then we didn't really gain steam, you know, until our like second season, second, third season. So, you know, what I knew of you is that, you know, you existed like I did on television as a girl. Um, And, you know, really not since kind of like Gidget, you know, did we really have shows that were like truly, truly about like really about a girl. Did you know that I auditioned for six at the same time as I was auditioning for Clarissa? I did not know that. I think it was up. I think it was between me and Jenna. Wow. I think it was like that close. I went like three times to three auditions for both. Oh my and gosh. I remember praying at night and being like, God, let me make, or let the right thing happen. That will, you know, wow. like, and it was like really interesting. I'm obviously you had already had the part of Blossom, but I was auditioning for six and it's kind of crazy because I do talk fast and I, <laughs> I think I could have had some fun with that part. But I mean, Jenna was brilliant and she's a good friend. But That is so funny. So I'm in my office and I have, I'm have i like a hoarder. I have like memorabilia everywhere. So I have this Nickelodeon thing 
And it's something about girls punching through like that girls. Oh my gosh, busy. that is so cool. Isn't it funny. I think it says something about Nickelodeon bunches punches through ratings barrier. Something about mm. uh one of the first times a girl like girls will be watched as lead. That so, is incredible. And it's the same time, like we were doing this ex- ex- exactly. Yeah, the that same did time. not exist on NBC. Let me tell you. Yeah. We had a lot of Playboy models to try and break through that ratings barrier. Um, But that's incredible. Okay, but um, so many amazing things. Also, like, you got to work with Joey Lawrence. Like, we have so many fun things that we can talk about. I've known Joey since I was, like, four years old. Okay, so so take us back, because you are from a place in New York that I've never heard of, which is fine, because there's a, New York's a very large state. People are Huge. just like, New York, no. It's actually the tiniest part is that little island that people think of. <laughs> but you are from, is it upstate? It's to the west. Oh, it's near no, Philadelphia. It's, oh, it's Long Island. Long Island. Oh my yeah. gosh. Sayville, yeah. So Long Island, it's like right in the middle of the island on the South Shore. It's like where the ferries go to Fire Island. Okay, got it. We used to drive into the city to audition all the time. That's how I'd, I'd actually run into Jenna. I'd run into Joey. Um, and, uh, and so I auditioned a lot in New York. And then when I started Clarissa, my parents got divorced. So I moved to the city when I was about 12 or 13. Okay. So I need to understand though, you are a child just like growing yeah. up and yeah. I'm assuming you're adorable cause you know, people are adorable. And, <laughs> um, was this like your, your, your parents, they were not in the industry. Mm-hmm. No, my dad was a clam, like a uh, clam breeder. My okay, mom stop, was stop, a- stop. <laughs> You can't just say that and expect me to let you keep talking. Is a clam breeder? Yeah, my dad. Do they need help? My dad gets. They do. They don't know how to yeah, do he it. Would on their impregnate own. the now he now he impregnates oysters. Um, no, it's what's uh, happening. What? That's not my Long actually, Island. This is the would, other kind of people that live on Long Island. Okay. <laughs> This you would actually be fascinated to talk to I'm my already sister. fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're like my my father and now my sister are like accidental marine biologists because got they got into this business of like my father and my uncle owned a boat yard and they started taking clams and figuring out how to kind of breed them. Yeah. So they would um then put them in the bay and uh they they I don't know if you ever went across the Great South Bay to Fire Island or something, you'd see a tree just like a random tree with like a bag on top. Right. And that means that's where someone's planted their oysters or clams down below. And so they kind of breed them there. So I'm sorry. (laughs) We're going to get to all the things that everybody wants to hear about. However, as someone who wanted to be a marine biologist in middle school, I need to talk about this. (laughs) I've known this at some point because as a neuroscientist, I was trained in biology. How do oysters and clams have sex? Um, I think it's something about, I mean, you're asking the wrong person. There's boys and girls. The rest of my family, but it's something about taking like the, I don't know if there's a male oyster, right. but like they spray something into the water. There's my, sh- my sister has this like maternity ward. Oh. So it's like a tank and there's certain oysters and then they'll like put something in, like, it'll look like a handful of sand and there'll be thousands of baby oysters. Oh. And so they'll breed them to that level and then they'll sell them to like Blue Point or someone. And maybe they send it to like, they probably won't send it to like PEI or something, but they'll do it around Long Island, Connecticut. Right. And then those oysters become, you know, they, they grow in the water that they're claimed okay. after. Did they have pearls? <laughs> no, I don't know. I've never, not that I know like of. a certain kind. Okay. So I need to ask another question. This is just your dad. I can't wait till we get to your mom. But j- did you like, was it like, we ate clams every night? Oh yeah. My mom won't eat them to this day. They got divorced. <laughs> is that why they like, got divorced? She's like, do not bring another clam in this house. Partly. I think the clam business wasn't really getting her the fur coat and diamonds <laughs> she wanted. So, <laughs> so now, that makes her sound spoiled. She's not so you, spoiled. No, no, no. But like, I, but please, I get it. So you would just like, you would eat clams. You would like, you. Lobsters. I, I, we actually got into lobsters I was raised and kosher. Was- you need to know, this is like the farthest <laughs> thing from things that I know about. I've never eaten one. No, I don't, no I was raised kosher. Oh. And that was like when I, when my mom stopped being kosher. It wasn't like, let's get, we couldn't afford a clam. So I've seen them eaten. It is not interesting to me at all, but you, (laughs) are there other ways to eat? I just know that they're like steamed and sometimes there's pasta around them. So many ways. Clams are one thing I'll eat any way that they're, they can be baked. They can be like chopped. They can be cooked. They can be raw. Oh, people fry them. It's an Italian thing. Yeah. Yeah. You put them in your linguine. Yeah. You like everything, like you'll have linguine and clam sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, g- clam sauce. That's from clams. I don't want to know about how they get that. Okay. So that's what your dog, that's what, that's what your dad did. Yep. 
And, yep. was and then your, he, he yeah. segued to a construction company and then to lobsters. He was a whole lobster wholesaler. I mean, so where we else buy- would you go if not lobsters? lobsters. <laughs> I've also <laughs> we, never we had, had a lobster. Lobsters, they were like a dollar a pound. So we would, you know, as opposed to when you buy them in the you know restaurant, and they're 50 bucks. <laughs> like They're also $1. alive $1. in a tank and you watch them and it's like a whole thing. I'm a vegan. It's not working. Okay. <laughs> so that was your, that was your dad's life. Was your, yeah. was your, so your mom was not in the end. She was a stay at home mom. Yeah, well, she was really young. She had me right before her 20th birthday. Oh, wow. And, and then when she was 22, had my, like every two years had a kid. And yeah, that's she's got a job. So <laughs> I'm the oldest of eight siblings. So eight. it's a very big family. Yeah. So your yeah, dad was family. breeding clams. Your mother just bred humans. <laughs> she did. <laughs> Sorry. It is true. I mean, that no, very respectfully. Thanks. Okay. So um, how many of you were there? For, are, are those all from your biological mom and dad? There's five. There's wow. four sisters and a brother. And then my mom remarried and had two. My dad remarried and had one. Oh all my girls, goodness. except for my brother. Yep. Wow. And today's his birthday. So happy birthday to my brother. <laughs> so you, do you remember liking to perform? Was this just something like, oh, we live near the city and like, let's see if she can be in commercials. Cause like that was a thing that happened. Yeah. It was really, do you remember the show Romper Room when we were little? Course, I mean, who doesn't remember Romper Room? <laughs> that was the, that was my inciting incident. Like I... <laughs> <laughs> Robin I had was an be- inciting incident for many things, but for <laughs> Melissa Joan Hart, it was to become an actress. I had to be on that. I had them, I needed them to say my name on that show, the magic mirror at the mm. end, right? And I realized I put it together that like I was four and I was like, I need her to say Melissa. She'll never <laughs> say Melissa. And then I realized, oh, she's saying the names of the kids in the audience. Wow. So I have to be in the audience for her to say my name. So I told my mom, like, I'm gonna need to get on TV. Wow. And she goes, actually, I know someone who just did that. I know someone who got their kid in, like they're doing a commercial or something. Maybe I'll call them. And so she called and she got me an audition and then she got me another audition. Uh, I mean, I got the audition and the callback, but it was so expensive to take the car into the city or the train into mm-hmm. the city and take the taxis around and, you know, then try to eat in the city and and then get home. It was an hour and a half each way to the city. Wow. So um, by the time she got the call that I booked the job. She goes, I can't afford to bring her anymore. We're, we're done. Hmm. And they're like, no, 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 you're going to get paid now. Like now that she got the job, you'll get paid. And she was like, oh, okay, well hmm. maybe we'll try that again. So I booked my first audition, my third audition, my fifth audition. And then I was just rolling. Wow. So she became like a, a she was probably 24 at the time. I was going to so say was- she was a, she was a kid herself, right? Yeah. And she had three kids at that point. So she's like dragging us all to the city. Wow. Doing auditions with us and taking us home. So, um, you, you know, you did, um, a a lot of things and I guess the first kind of, I guess the first kind of thing that, that people now know you for, you know, as a sort of long-term gig though, um, was Clarissa. Do you remember, do you remember sort of what the process was around that kind of set of auditions and that time of your life? Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, like, literally I'm simultaneously auditioning for Clarissa and for Blossom. And so I'm like, I'm in the city, like auditioning. I felt like it went on for weeks, right. Of like, will I get one of these shows, you know? And so with Clarissa, it was, I remember the third audition, I think was the one where I guess I wore the same outfit. I don't know if you did this, like audition. If they liked it once, they're going to like it again. Yep. Lucky, lucky outfit. I booked it once. I get, or they liked it so far. We're going to keep traveling down that road. So I wore like a pink t-shirt and like bright blue overalls. And I guess the strap kept falling at the same point each time. And he thought it was like, a like I was doing like a thing. He thought I was like, you know, that, you know, kind of actor that was like planning when I was going to lift this, like it was part of, I like, I wrote it in my script or something. And I was like, no, I think I did the same body movement and it fell. Right. But anyway, so I go in for the third audition and I'm meeting with the producer and he asks me, he goes, do you like new kids on the block? And I immediately went, oh, I hate them. <laughs> and then I went, oh my gosh, he probably, kn- he's in the industry. He probably knows them. Like, why would I say that? And he goes, oh, okay, who do you like? And I went, they might be giants. Mm. And he was like, okay. And I'm like, I blew it. I blew it. I left the audition. I was like, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. My mom goes, we're wasting our time on these auditions all the time. And, you know, it, you know it's always when you're ready to quit the business that you get something. <laughs> So we were ready to quit the business and then uh and then Clarissa happened. Wow. And I just, you know, I want to I want to kind of underscore like how significant, you know, that was for you as an actress. You know, my experience was like I was in this movie and like people were like, "Oh, you should have your own show." But that's like a very that's like a strange route. I mean, every route is strange, I think for the lives that we that we live, but 
what I think is so exceptional about your story, it's like, it's really, really like hardcore fantasy of like, you, you know, they could have picked any number of girls, right? They didn't want a blonde. They mm. refused to have a blonde play Clarissa. Like the producer did not want me. He was mm. trying everything he could to not have me um, because he thought that smart girls can't be blonde. Like he wanted her to be <laughs> smart, nonconformant, you know, like uh, the eighties. And he was like, I don't want a blonde. Like, that's not what I'm looking for here. And, um, I had done a play. I, I, I was big into Broadway when I was like, maybe between the ages of like eight and 12. And I had just done, or was doing at the same time as I was auditioning, I was doing a play at night at the player's theater called Imagining Brad. Um, and I was this small part. I was a monologue at the opening of the play called the Valerie of now. And I was on stage for 30 minutes by myself, singing, dancing. It's a little girl who just got her period for the first time mm -hmm. and doesn't know what to do. And it's just sort of her flailing, like, what do I do? What do I do? And she sort of comes to the realization that she's a woman now in that night. But then you find out the next part of the play, it gets a little dark, but like the next part of the play is that she's, um, you find out that she was beaten and abused by her father that night. So mm -hmm. she marries a man with no arms and no legs. So it's, it's a very strange, it was written by Peter Hedges. It was directed by Joe Mantello, who mm. went on to do Wicked and like massive, right? Like huge shows. And so it was because of that play, though, that a, a veterinarian of the producer, uh, I guess the producer went into the vet's office and, and found a dog named Valerie and was like, why did you name the dog Valerie? He's like, I found it in an alleyway after this play last night. And this girl was amazing. Mm. And he was like, you need to see her for the audition for Clarissa. Wow. And that's why. So the veterinarian recommended me. <laughs> It was like very strange. Mind Beyond's Breakdown is supported by Squarespace. Squarespace is awesome. It's the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, even your time. Squarespace makes it easy for creators and educators to monetize their content and expertise in a way that fits their brand. There's member areas where you can unlock a new revenue stream for your business and free up time in your schedule by selling access to gated content like classes, online courses, or newsletters. Stand out in any inbox with Squarespace email campaigns. Collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. You start with an email template and then you can customize it by applying your brand ingredients like site colors and logo. Built-in analytics will help you measure the impact of every send. Also, you got a cause? Support your cause by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. You can also gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site and how they're interacting with your content with in-depth website analytics tools like page views, traffic sources, time on site, most read content, audience geography, and so much more. Squarespace also has powerful blogging tools to share stories, photos, videos, and updates. You can categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. Display posts from your social profiles on your website and automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so that your followers can share it too. Go to squarespace.com slash breakdown for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code BREAKDOWN to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Lion B. Alex Breakdown is supported by K-12. As a parent, you want to set your kids up for success. That starts with empowering them to learn in ways that are best for them. K-12 powered schools can help your child start reaching their full potential in life now and give you the support you need to get them there. K-12 powered schools are tuition-free, online accredited public schools for kindergarten through 12th grade, designed to help your child to learn at their own pace and in their own place with an engaging curriculum that supports individual learning styles. This is different from homeschooling where you're responsible for teaching them. K-12 powered schools, state certified teachers are trained online educators. They utilize hands-on innovative technology to make learning interactive. K-12 powered schools even offer social opportunities, extracurricular activities, and in-person events. K-12 has more than 20 years experience helping students gain the skills they truly need to thrive in the future, and it could be perfect for your child too. Join the more than 2 million families who've been served by K-12 and empower your student to reach their full potential now. Go to k12.com slash breakdown today to learn more and find a tuition-free K-12-powered school near you. That's the letter K, the number 12.com slash breakdown. K-12.com slash breakdown. You essentially were you know, we're, we're chosen to be the face of like what became like a brand and an identity, yeah. you know, and like a touch point for, for such a, also like a really specific part of that genre of television, you know? Well, and the launching of cable, right? So we right. were like, you said, 
Blossom took a little while to get off. We really took a long time to get off the ground because nobody had cable really at this time. I right? didn't. No, a lot of people didn't have cable boxes in New York. A few people did. So I started getting recognized on the street earlier in New York than anywhere else. But, um, you know, it was just having to like, I don't know. I was the first time I got recognized. I remember being so embarrassed, like, Oh, you watch Nickelodeon? Like, no one watches <laughs> like, unless it's a game show, like, why are you watching Nickelodeon? Right. You know? But, um, but yeah. And then the, the, the female, um, aspect of it all too, to be, and the writers on our show went on to do, I mean, like Paul Lieberstein went on to do The Office and Alexi Young went on to run Friends. And mm. we had some amazing writers that I think you've worked alongside as mm -hmm. well and um, and just really had some powerhouse writing behind it. So it just, it, it was kind of like, you know, I know in a way a lot like Blossom, right? It was like five characters, just ca like stories, just right. stories, you know, no kind of pranks and stuff happening, just sort of like really... Right. Well, and it was also it was the beginning of kind of like a um, you know a shift for Nickelodeon because it really hadn't been you know known predominantly as a as a show for like or as a network for sort of like scripted material and, and narrative like that. So it was very very unusual. Um, what was your what was your life like at that time? Were you still going back to school in between filming? Like, did you have a schedule? Like, our schedule was basically like a school year. You know, we filmed kind of like August to April or August to May. Was was it the same for Nickelodeon? And how did you handle school at that time? We kind of did. We did like half seasons, sort of mm -hmm. the way the streamers do now. We did like thirteen episodes a season. Mm -hmm. um, so we almost did like yeah, like a half a season, right? Without the back end order, really. So we would kind of disappear. I would, I would disappear to Orlando for four months at a time, mm -hmm. um, get tutored while I was down there, and then go back to New York and go back to school. So it was tricky. I mean, I was in ninth grade, and I was a really good student. I love, I love learning. I'm still like a lifelong learner, and uh, and so I'm I'm constantly kind of chasing what I missed in high school now because mm -hmm. I was this great student. I was going to learn all these languages in 10th grade and all this stuff, but then the show happened. And, um, I was supposed to finish all my New York sequences in 10th grade. You know, I was like so excited to like push through my academics. And, um, and then I get the show and I'm being tutored Mondays. I don't know if you guys did the same thing, but like Mondays is math, six no. hours in math on oh, Monday. No. Who and then you wait till next Monday to do math again and no. French on Tuesdays <laughs> and science on what. So it was like nothing retaining, nothing sticking just kind of pushing through. Mm. And so I ended up changing schools. I was in public school until ninth grade. Then 10th grade, I went to professional children's school with like Sarah Michelle Geller and Tara Reed and, and, and Jerry O'Connell. And, um, and so tried that, that didn't work for me. Then for 11th and 12th, I did what now I guess we would call homeschooling, right? But tutoring basically. Right. Um, and so you kind of went, then you went to sort of like your second exploration of you as like the centerpiece, you know, of a television kind of identity um, with Sabrina, which a lot of people, you know, I, th I think it depends what what age you are, you know, kind of like what your jam was. But, um, you know, I, I knew you from from both, but a lot of people, you know, do have more, you know, kind of knowledge with Sabrina. How did that come about after Clarissa? Because also like what's really cool is that like they're both you but there's also like a real fun distinctiveness to, you know, as you got older and, you know, obviously Sabrina had, you know, a very different flavor to it. It was what we would now call high concept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And a hybrid. Um, interestingly enough, Clarissa, so Clarissa ended and my mom being my manager for many years was getting all these offers for me to play really risque. Like I was auditioning for like Lolita and like all these things that my mom was like, I don't think after Nickelodeon, that's what you should be doing. She knew branding before branding, right? She was like the original momager, I feel like in a way. <laughs> like she was like, let's, we need to find something family friendly or create something family friendly. And someone handed her a comic book, an Archie comic on a playground with my, at my sibling's school. And uh, they said, this would be a great project for Melissa. Wow. It's Sabrina the Teenage Witch, one of the Archie comics. So she brought it to Showtime. Actually, she brought it to Viacom because Clarissa was on Viacom. She had, we had a connection there. She brings it to them. She goes, we should make this movie. We make the Showtime movie. She cuts it together. She goes, this should be a series. They go, well, eh, we'll see. We'll see. She cuts it together in like a trailer. She sells the series to three different networks. Wow. And the next thing you know, I'm 20 years old playing a teenager again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how long did Sabrina run? It was seven seasons. Wow. Seven years, yeah. And so that was kind of like, that was really your your teen years into young adulthood where essentially you lived on television. Yeah. I mean, by the time I'm 20 and I moved to LA, I 
you know, with the money I made in my first episode, I bought myself a BMW. And then I, uh, by the time I finished my first season, I bought my first house and I was like now an adult. And what was great was not having to go to school. Mm. You can like not having to go to school and get to work and like, and then afterwards go out dancing. And like, (laughs) I was like, this is awesome. We can go shoot pool after work. I don't have to go home and study my lines for tomorrow or like, (laughs) because Sabrina also was the first time Clarissa, I had massive monologues. Hmm. And I would have to start memorizing those on Sunday to shoot on Thursday because I mean, I have three or four an episode and they'd be pages long and I'd have to be direct to camera. There was no cutting. There was no editing. Hmm. So I had to learn those and those were a bitch, man. And then school and then the, you know, senior year with the SATs and college applications and all that stuff. It was just too much. So when I got Sabrina and I was like, I have dialogue scenes where I can bounce off other people. (laughs) I like, you can cue me into what my next line is. And I'm only doing two pages at a time. This is awesome. So I loved that life. And I made some of the best friends in my life and had such fun with that. And it is, like you said, it's like, that show is international. That show has made people happy Mm -hmm. across the board for decades now. And I couldn't be prouder of it because anywhere I go in the world, I hear people say, I learned English from your show. I I'm a scientist because Beth Broderick played a scientist or I got into fashion because of, you know, like people, or I was in the hospital for a long time, you know, recovering from surgery or something. And they'll say that that was like their, their happy place. And so it's just such a nice thing to hear when we hear that. Right. It's like, sure. That's how we do it. Well, and, and also, um, there was a a brief period kind of between these two shows where you did go to college. Um, (laughs) yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, did it, did it suit you or were you kind of like, I want to try this, but it's not for me. Like, how did that work out? Like the 80 year old that's going to throw my cap at the, I just saw like (laughs) NYU just had their graduation. I'm like, I need to do that someday. (laughs) Um, I applied to NYU. It was the only college I knew about. I knew about one in Florida because I was down there, but I really didn't know much about college. I was the oldest in my family. My parents hadn't gone to college. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I saw an NYU shuttle go by one day, like a trolley. And I was like, that's where I should go. That looks fun. I want to get on that. (laughs) But meanwhile, I've never been on the trolley, but I was like, I should go to NYU. So I applied to NYU. I didn't think my grades were good enough to get in. I tricked my way in by getting into Tisch. Mm-hmm. as an actor, and then immediately transferring to the Gallatin program, individualized study. And I tried for like seven years to graduate, but I was doing Sabrina in LA at the same time. And I couldn't quite, I couldn't get the credits. I went on a broad trip one summer to try to get some credits. And I did an internship in directing and did all these things to try to get the credits, but never quite made it there. So now I've got to start again. And Someday. someday. Do you, um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you, you have, you've, you've gone on to do you know, so many incredible things, including directing. And you you did an episode of Young Sheldon, which is, you know, so awesome. Um, do you still feel a desire to, to like have that as a benchmark? It's something I never finished. And like, I need to go finish it, right? Like I need to have that moment. It feels like a rite of passage I missed. I missed so many. I never had my own prom. I never had a real graduation in high school. They threw me one on the set. Mm-hmm. But there's so many things I missed. And I'm like, that is not something I'm going to like, it's something I can still do, you know? So it's still out there. Um, I just recently took a course at Belmont. I moved to Nashville. So I took a course at Belmont on screenwriting. And a few years ago, I took a course on Italian. I wanted like photography. I'm like, so I'm going to figure this out somehow. Yeah. I'm going to, when my kids are out of the house, I have one going to college next year, my first one. So I'm like, mm-hmm. once they're out of the house, maybe I'll go back to college. <laughs> but yeah, I do want to, I mean, and like you said, I direct a lot now. It wasn't as easy when I started directing in maybe 2000. Um, I started on Sabrina. I did some other shows for Nickelodeon and Disney. And then it was always sort of a PR stunt. But then I started directing the Goldbergs. And then um, Adam Goldberg recommended me to the the boys at Sheldon and the Steves. And and they just, they they took, I mean, we all had a Nickelodeon uh, history as well, me and the Steves at Young Sheldon. So I was, I directed a bunch of young Sheldon. So we have that connection as well. Like, (laughs) yeah. And, and tell me, you know, I think a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people may, may know that there are obviously directors of shows, but can you talk a little bit about sort of what's the skill set that you drew on or that you draw on, um, to direct that, that kind of format? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, that's the thing, right? I jump back and forth between multicam and single cam. And so, uh, like Goldberg's and young Sheldon are a single cam, Um, and, uh, it's interesting. Well, they have two cameras, but we shoot it like a, you know, shot as if it's a single cam. So it's shot like a little movie. 
is what it's that a means. little bit more theatrical. Yeah. It has that sort of more cinematic feel to it. Right. Um, and for me, so I was a, a big fan of Gary Marshall and I was lucky enough to spend a little time with him where he mentored me a little and basically just said that the fundamental, like the, the basic of directing is tell the story, just make sure you tell the story. Right. So I always go back to that really, you know, that we're, we're here to tell a story. What's going to tell the story the best, like, you know, angles, character development, all those things. So, and I think with, um, with young Sheldon, there is a very specific humor to it. So bringing that kind of, I think the Steves and I have this, especially with Molaro, like we have like this shorthand kind of, we, we sort of see things similarly. He trusted me because I think he saw pretty early on that we had a similar eye, especially for the comedy part of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think, uh, winning his trust was one of the biggest moments in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that basically having a rapport with the actors and then working well with the crew and trusting them that this is their show, like you're going to go on the show like that, especially something like, I think it was third season. You're not going to find a new corner <laughs> to film in, right? You're not going to talk to the actors about their character because they know their character better than you do. So, you know, it's really about bringing in energy and I like to be efficient. Like that's how I started directing was to be efficient. On Sabrina, it was such a difficult show as a hybrid. So we would rehearse for two days, film for three. And we shot it like a single cam, but it was three mm -hmm. camera film. So it was shot like a multi, but ended up looking like a single. So it was, uh, it was a little tricky. And we'd have these veteran directors come on and go, I don't understand what to do with the cat. What do we do with the special effects? <laughs> Our special effects guy went off to do Game of Thrones and, you know, like, it was a complicated show. We all learned so much on that show. My and Beyond's Breakdown is supported by Stitch Fix. Get the star treatment with your own personal stylist. That's right. With Stitch Fix, you'll have access to real stylists who will work with you to create a wardrobe that is tailored just for you. I love Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix has a range of wear now styles in season ready colors, trends and patterns to help you refresh your wardrobe. With Stitch Fix, you can get a personal stylist who will curate the perfect pieces for your unique style and fit. Get started now and bring some new life to your wardrobe this season. Stitch Fix is the best way to discover new styles and brands just for you. Think of Stitch Fix as your style partner. And since I have very little style, I need a partner. Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks you love. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically like to shop, what you like to wear, and your price range. That's really it. With your choices in mind and a wide range of sizes available from extra small to 3XL, they will find your perfect fit. They've got you covered with over 1,000 brands and styles. Try your pieces at home before you buy. You just keep what you love and send back the rest. It is so easy. Plus, shipping returns and exchanges are always free. There is no subscription required. You just order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular seasonal fixes, which is what I like to do. You are in control. I famously have a difficult time figuring out what to wear and what to put with what. And the thing that I love about Stitch Fix is I literally told them, this is my comfort zone. This is where I'm willing to get frisky. And then they not only give me items that look good together, they look good with the things that are already in my closet. I absolutely love Stitch Fix. I've used it for myself, for my kids. I recommend it to everyone. And now I'm recommending it to all of you. Try Stitch Fix today at stitchfix.com slash break and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash break for 25% off today. Stitchfix.com slash break. I also want to mention you've been dubbed the queen of Christmas. Um, <laughs> you, have, you have a production company, um, mm -hmm. which I also think it's adorable that like all your things that you create have the spelling heart, like heartbreak films, but like it's spelled like Melissa Joan Hart. It's just such a perfect last name for so many things. It's, so, it's like a great last name. Um, so you, you have a, a production banner, as they call it. Um, yeah. What do you like about sort of the lifetime experience as, as an actor and, and as a producer? They've been great to me over the last like decade, I guess. Um, I've been lucky enough to have a Christmas movie on almost every year, whether I directed it or I starred in it. Um, and they have just been so great to me. And what I love about them is while the Christmas movie, you know, it, it sort of fits in a certain box, right? It's got to have a happy ending. There's, 
very little conflict except in romance. And, you know, there's, there's certain, and then there's certain elements that have to, it has to be sprinkled in, you know, snow and, and, and nothing but green and red, right? Like nothing but green and red. So, um, it just was such a fun way to tell stories and try to keep trying to find something new. But what I love about Lifetime is they let me be a little bit funny. They're okay with sometimes not a perfectly happy ending, like not getting the girl and guy together. We've done two or three movies now. And I think we're about to do another one where they don't get together at the end, which that's a rare thing. So I like just playing around with the format a little bit. I always knew that there were like these people who liked Christmas movies, but I feel (laughs) like it's become so much, you know, so much bigger of a phenomenon. And like, there's such a, there's such a great audience for it. I mean, like people, right. It's become a total genre and like, it's become, you know, it's become like a real kind of identity point, you know, for the holidays, like these kinds of movies. Um, And it's only getting bigger, strangely, because everyone's starting to jump into it. Yeah. Do you, is this something you, you like to continue doing? Like, is this sort of like, you can imagine this being sort of your, your annual commitment, like sort of to the Christmas season? Um, that's the way it's been. I don't think it's going to continue that way necessarily for me. Um, I think that there'll be those opportunities, but I'd like to do, I'd like to do a little bit more outside the box with it, I mm-hmm. think. Um, but it is a really fun, you know, the wonderful thing about them, cause it, it is puzzling, right? Like I was like, why are these things so popular? At first I was like, this is where careers go to die. I don't want to be a part of it. And then it started, it's very lucrative. It's very like, it's just fun. It's happy. Like you go to these Christmas cons, I'm going to one in Kansas city in a few weeks. And it's like, it's just a happy, joyful What's everyone. A Christmas con? I know they're doing these, uh, they what do one that? in Jersey and now they're doing one in Kansas city in July. Do they um, serve clams? Kids. Yeah, they serve clams. <laughs> no, no, but it's coast- like, hold on. I again, like, I'm Jewish. I'm all the things that don't mix with some of the things <laughs> we're talking about. So what? Wait, what happens at a Christmas? Co- it's like all things Christmas. It's like, well, they bring, it's mainly <clears throat> celebrities, and then there'll be booths. So there'll be like someone that makes cookies and a hot cocoa thing, and like you know. But it's women that show up in their sweat matching sweaters with their mom or their yeah. Girl. Does Everyone's Santa come? And, there has yeah, to be Santa there. Santa comes. And That's all the fun. like stars of all the different Christmas movies, like Lacey Chabert's always there. Oh, Danica. this is amazing. I need to go to one of these just to see what happens. That feels like something we should do. Did you do 90s con? I did not do 90s con. I knew it was happening, but I'm more interested in Christmas con. I know, but I think you need to come to 90s con. Also, I grew up in Los Angeles. My parents are New Yorkers, but like I grew up in LA, so it never snowed. Like nothing Christmas-like yeah. ever happened. And also I'm Jewish, but still I, there would be these like, Christmas stores where you would like see, and then they started popping up more and more. Like, I love a Christmas store. I've never had a tree in my life. I have no desire to have one, but there's, there's a, there's some magical quality to sort of like the culture surrounding Christmas. I'm very fascinated by this. It becomes a whole thing, right? It's, it's kind of taken over. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit pissed off at Christmas in general, just because it's like so excessive. I'm like the cards and the decorating. and the angry at Christmas. You're the queen of Christmas. You can't be angry at Christmas. No, don't tell anybody. Just between us, okay? (laughs) I mean, honestly, when the movie Elf came out, I was like, this is the greatest Christmas movie that will ever be made. I mean, I do love like Miracle on 34th Street, 42nd Street, 86th Street, which street? 34th. 34th Street. (laughs) Um, I mean, I love a Christmas movie, but like when Elf came out, I was like, I get it. Like I'll watch that every year. I think that um, the thing about, the thing that people love about those movies is it's predictable. I think the, I think the holidays, everyone pretends it's, you know, it's supposed to be about hope and and love and family and stuff, but it's, it ends up being so much about commercialism. So I think it's nice for people to just kind of watch something that's predictable. That's, you know, I think we forget a lot about the people that lose people or that don't have someone at the holidays, have a breakup, have a divorce, whatever, you know, and it's tough times. Sometimes people can't afford to throw the kind of Christmas they want to have and that kind of thing. So watching these movies, I think just gives people a happy place to go to in a season. You know, I actually, I've never heard that kind of explanation. And I think that's very astute because I think also it's not like we're watching it because that's what life is like. We're watching it because that's not always what life is like. And we know that, like, it feels like a real acknowledgement of like, there are ways to show, you know, a different side of happiness. Like, I think that's really, I think that's really sweet. Yeah, it's like an escapism for a minute. Um, Okay. I'm asking you one more Christmas question and then we'll move on. I promise. (laughs) What, what are, what is your life like for Christmas? Like, are you one of these people? Like, I'm just going to give an example. Are you one of these people who has like the green and red, you know, like Tupperware containers with all like the wrapping things and are your ornaments like classified? Like these are the ones that are white. And like, are you do this? Are you this lady? 
I do all of that. I am okay. I'm very organized. First of all, I mean, that's the only way to be. If you like Christmas, you have to be organized around it. It's a lot. It's a lot. I'm not kidding. Like it is a lot. And so you have, if you're not organized with, are you putting up the travel ornaments this year? Like hundred percent or the kids ornaments of the right. macaroni crap or the, like, what are we putting on the tree this year? Cause we can't put it all up there. <laughs> so you have to be organized or it's okay, a mess. So when do you start preparing for Christmas before Thanksgiving? Nowadays. Yeah. Oh, like, Oh, you like My today, husband, like this summer. Uh, he, yeah. There might still be a treat. No, I'm just kidding. No, there's not. But you, but you prepare in advance. Every railing, every window has a wreath. Every, I mean, my husband goes off. Every railing has a garland. Every, like, is every there Santa Claus toilet has, paper? We don't wipe our butts with Santa Claus, but, but you're, but you're thinking like every bathroom is decorated. Yes. That's yes. amazing. I have little reindeer in the bathrooms. Yes. Towels. The towels are hanging with all the different, uh, all the towels in the house get changed to Christmas towels. Do you all wear matching Christmas BJs? Yeah. Is that your holiday card? No, it's, we usually it do should be. A, a little more formal. We tried that one year. Uh, oh, more for, wait, we do like a formal Christmas card? We do like a formal Christmas card because it's like our family photo for the year. And it's like the only way I feel like I can mark how everybody grows. It's the only time I, my boys will actually hold still. Do you have and pets? Let me get yes. Do and they those dress are up for Christmas? They do. What do they wear? Do you make them look well, like reindeer? They just wear like red and green collars or something. Well, step it up, Melissa Jonah. Step <laughs> I'll send it up. you a picture. I'll send I want you a them picture. to be reindeer. I want you to have <laughs> Dasher and Dancer and Donner and I don't know their names. Dixon, Dixon, yeah, all Dixon. of them. All of them. Um, okay, this is fascinating. Yeah, we get insane. No, it's not. It's uh it's slightly embarrassing. It, it is you're, uh, um also just to give it a little bit of reference, you were raised Presbyterian, is that correct? I was raised Catholic. Oh, Catholic. Catholic. No. oh Catholic. Oh, you're Presbyterian now. Those are different things. Yeah, well, yeah, it depends on who you're talking to. As a Catholic, I didn't think so. But now living in the South and going to a Baptist church, people do think Catholic is very, yeah. Very well, so, different. but like there's, forgive me, there's Catholic and then there's uh, Protestant. That's what they're called. Yes. Yeah. That's the other ones. Under the umbrella of Protestant. Yeah. Oh, we got it. So, uh, okay, well, now I need to ask this. Is Catholic Christmas yep. different than Presbyterian Christmas? No, only in the church service, really. Okay, but you go to church on Christmas. Like, you're that person. It's not just oh. like, let's have a tree. It's like, it's a religious holiday. And every Advent, Advent is every Sunday, four weeks leading up to Christmas. So every Sunday leading up to it, and you light a candle every night. In a, in a lot of the ways, like you would a menorah, we light a candle every night. What's Advent for? Advent is to count down the days. And each candle is a different representation of, um, uh, one's a love candle, one's a hope candle, one's a... One scene in Catholicism. Is there an anxiety one... candle? Because that's the only thing that would remind me of a menorah. Maybe the one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, like Seventh Day Adventists. That's what they're called. Yeah. So I don't the know Advent, why. Advent is like so you get an Advent calendar when you get your chocolates. That's you the, like, the right. They they have them for pets. I've seen them in yeah. the pet store. Yeah. So you have an Advent calendar, and you'll open every day. You would open one and get a chocolate out, and that counts down to Christmas. I see. Got it. Okay. But um, some people celebrate, like, I knew the song, The 12 Days of Christmas. Is that a thing? I don't know what that is. I No, it's not a thing anymore. Is it, it Catholics? Must have been... They celebrate into January sometimes? Oh, well, that's because of the Three Kings. The Three Kings course, come, like, because January of the Three Kings. Day. Yeah, the Three Kings Day is, like, January 3rd or 6th. Were they 6th. Jewish, too? <laughs> of course they were. Jesus was Jewish. Okay, got it. So the Kings, oh, that's what I meant in terms of two. Yeah. I mean, I need to learn more things. Um... <laughs> Okay, sorry. This is just like Melissa Joan Hart teaches Mayim about clams and Christmas. And Christmas. I love was. it. Okay, <laughs> let's get back to non-Christmas things, although I do appreciate the education. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about working with Joey Lawrence because... Um, Why don't you tell me about working with well, Joey so Lawrence I worked, I worked with Joey Lawrence. Let's see, I was 14 to 19 and he was, whatever, a year younger than me. Um, and then he went on to do the show with his brothers. And then, yes. you know, somewhere in the ether, like I went to college, I had two kids, I went to grad school. And somewhere in there, the two of you did Melissa and Joey. Um, did. How did that come about? You had obviously vaguely known each other or did you design this together? Sort of. So we, um, we knew each other like since we were like six, we've been on a lot. Actually, he's on my podcast coming up and he, we tell the story about like how we met when we were young and awesome. stuff. But our moms knew each other from the audition waiting room and stuff. So his youngest brother, Andy, is supposedly a product of seeing one of my siblings holding the baby and being like, all right, I need another one. And then she went home and got pregnant with oh Andy. Oh my so, gosh, that's so funny. So supposedly that's that's how Andy came to be. But um, 
anyway, uh, we ended up in LA. I'd done Sabrina. We had never worked together. We'd run into each other numerous times over the years. And then I had to do a, uh, I, oh, I'd done a Christmas movie. I'd done Holiday in Handcuffs with Mario Lopez. And Holiday in Handcuffs? Holiday in Handcuffs. I know. Try to go to, go to Canada and get a work permit for that one. I don't really want you I'm in. assuming this has something to do with like being arrested. Yeah, well, I kidnap him and make him pretend to be my. It's, it's That's actually a little kinky, Melissa Joan Hart. That's a little kinky. It's really funny, and it's still one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on because it's so ridiculous. But it kind of launched this TV genre of, of Christmas movies because it was so popular. I think it's still today like one of the most popular Christmas movies on wow. television. Wow, uh, not like you know Home Alone and the the big Christmas theatrical releases, like as far as television goes. But Holiday in Handcuffs was a big success, and it was me and Mario, and, and Mario had been on Dance with Stars, so I had to go do another movie for them, and it was called My Fake Fiance. I was producing it, hmm. and my mother and I producing it with Heartbreak Films. We were like, well, who should we get to play the guy? You know, we did so well with Mario. Who else has been on Dancing with Stars that we haven't worked with in a while? And I was like, oh my God, Joey. We need to have Joey. Wow. So Joey and I did this movie, Fake Fiance. And from that, we just, the chemistry between us and that the, the the network loved, we were like, let's create a show around this, around two people that need each other but don't like each other. Got it. And so we did this really funny, like Holiday in Handcuffs is probably my favorite movie I've ever been in. And then Melissa and Joey is my favorite TV show. It's like mm. I picked a child that was my favorite and it's Melissa and Joey because it's just ridiculously funny. And it's, it's stupid funny. And I get to play this very flawed character. I'm like this drunk lush who takes in her sister's kids. She's a politician too. <laughs> she has to take in her, her sister gets arrested um, for fraud and she has to take in her sister's teenage kids and raise them. And Joey shows up at my door and ends up being my Manny. And so we hate Got each it. other, but we need each other. And a lot of sexual tension and stuff like that. But really, it's just a lot of kind of jabs, quick jabs at each other and just ridiculousness. Like, neither of us know how to be parents and we're just failing at every turn. Uh, I'm getting like a little bit who's the boss vibes. I remember people would it's mention. Very much like, well, yes. yeah, because I remembered people would mention that. It was, you know, um, I mean, I find you more compelling as a lead character than the way they wrote Judith Light. But that's just me. It's a different time. Well, that's the thing I refused to when we were, because we did develop the show, I was lucky that I have some friends that have played those characters of the, like, you know, the wife that stands there and goes, "Mm -hmm." Mm -hmm. no. And I was like, I don't want to be that. And that's what I felt like when you, you kind of, you kind of talked about like Clarissa and Sabrina and how different they were. Clarissa felt funky, cool, nonconformist, edgy, right? Like kick-ass, fearless, all that. And then I went and did Sabrina and I just didn't really identify with her. I know a lot of people did and, you know, no disrespect to Sabrina at all, but I didn't identify with the character that's, that's like, Ooh, don't look at me. I want to hide in the corner. Cause that wasn't me. Mm. I was the, the loud talkative. I want a million friends in the room. Let's go to a party. Let's do stuff. And Sabrina was a little bit more reserved, a little bit more shy, a little, you know, um, a little bit like wants to be the wallflower over the center of attention. And I just didn't really get her necessarily. So when I went to do Melissa and Joey and I'm playing Mel, I could just be ridiculous. It was very Lucy, right? Mm. So I got to just kind of be larger than life with that, which was really fun. That is fun. And um, I do want to ask something, you know, the thing that like teen actors are always asked when they grow up, um, you know, especially because you do describe yourself as like an outgoing person and, you know, liking to be around people and parties. Um, you did not you know, experience any public or private that you have spoken about, you know, kind of brushes with a lot of the things that plague, you know, humans in general, not just celebrities. But um, but I feel like because you are such kind of like a positive role model, I mean, I consider you, you know, this like really positive and inspiring, you know, powerful, smart, funny, awesome woman. Um, I wonder if you would speak a little bit, you know, sort of about, um, you know, those things were around us. You know, even yeah. though I think you probably grew up similarly to the way Joey and Jenna and I did on a clean set. You know, we grew up on a very clean set and Don Rio, our showrunner, um, kept a very clean and healthy environment. I mean, I'm assuming it was similar for you, especially in the Nickelodeon world, but that stuff was around. Um, and I'm wondering what you credit. Like, I don't know if you're, you know, if you were a, a person of faith and that kind of kept you on a specific path um, or if it was, you know, kind of the guidance of your mom. Like, what sort of yeah. guided you? You know, it's interesting. Um, I've tried to give that a lot of thought and like dig into it all. And I realized like on Clarissa, I actually have a picture. I'll, I'll have to post this at some point. Um, two pictures. I just found them. They're actual photographs, right? So I had to like take a picture of the picture. <laughs> um, 
there, the crew on Clarissa. So I was in Orlando by myself. My mom wasn't on set with me and stuff. So I wasn't as much as I was protected as a child and in the theater world and whatnot with my mom being right there. Um, now I'm in Orlando and I'm 13, 14 and I'm kind of on my own. I have guardians and stuff, but the thing is we were working so hard. I don't think I had time to do anything. The crew would go out Friday nights and they would take me with them to a bar Hmm. and I wasn't allowed to drink. No one would allow me to, no matter how mad I got, I kicked one guy in the shins with my Sean. I had a crush on him. I kicked him in the shins with my combat boots and was like, get me a beer. And he's like, no, I'm not getting you a beer because I want to keep my job. And I'm so thankful for that now. Right? Like as mad as I got, like, give me a beer. They would be like, no, I'm not. And, um, and I still have some really, really good friends. Like my best friends, my son, my oldest son's godparents are the executive producer's assistant and the wardrobe supervisor from Clarissa. So they're still my best friends and they looked out for me and they became like a family and they surrounded me and they protected me. And also I think because there was something about me being the lead where I felt like I was responsible the same way I'm the Mm. oldest of eight kids and I feel responsible. I I have a very serious sense of responsibility and I don't want to disappoint anybody. So I have to memorize those monologues. I have to, you know, show up on set or so-and-so doesn't get to go home to their child for their, you know, big polo match or whatever. Like I realize this, this huge weight that's on my shoulders of like, if you don't show up on time and you don't know your lines and you make everyone wait, that's not only embarrassing. That's, that's, uh, that's like super rude. You're just selfish. Like, so I didn't want to be that person. So I think that there was this sense of responsibility that was just infused in me at a young age of doing the right thing and, and, and being responsible for myself. And so that carried from Clarissa to Sabrina. And then at Sabrina, I had my mom to protect me, like all the Me Too movement stuff. Of course, when that all happened, everyone's asking me, what's my story? Right. My mom was always right there with me. My mom has a few Me Too movement stories because she ended up, you know, getting, having meetings with producers that kind of could have gone in bad directions. Mm-hmm. But really my mom is there the whole time. And again, I'm the, I'm the lead of the show. And as you know, as a lead of a show, you like set a tone and it was, if I hit my marks and I say my lines and I show up on time, everyone else should too, right? Like if I start to slip, everyone else could, they could, they might slip. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying that's necessarily always true with everybody, but I I felt that sense of responsibility. Like I've got to set an example. I've got to be, you know, uh, they're, they're looking at me. I'm the one on camera. I'm the one that's got to say the lines. I'm the one that's got to do the work. Once the cameras are rolling, everyone Mm -hmm. else is of course working behind the scenes. But, um, so, you know, I, I just felt that sense of responsibility probably kept me on a really good track. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't have some rebellious moments because around, I had just a, you know, kind of an arrested development as far as a delayed bad behavior, which was probably in my early twenties, 22, 24, mm-hmm. where I did, you know, go out and party, but I would party on hiatus weeks. You know, I would <laughs> dabble with mushrooms when I was on a trip to Utah and the walking through the woods or do ecstasy when I was in Ibiza or, you know, like, I was careful about where, when, how am I recovering? How am I getting home? You know, I would go out and have a gin and tonic every night and go dancing and show up tired on set. That was about as irresponsible as I got. (laughs) Um, I'm curious. um, I mean, I think everyone feels happy that, you know, you experienced some, you know, some, some, I guess, like release of that pressure because it is a lot of pressure. And I think like that's, you know, when I hear about you talk about that responsibility, like part of that is like in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, is she straight edge? Then she, I was like, oh, no, she's not straight edge. Like she, you know, had a thing. Oh, for, for people who might be young or maybe that wasn't a term, um, straight edge is a term for someone who, you know, kind of like proudly and confidently abstains, you know, like as a as a movement. Um, you know, there it's are, coming back around, I think, because my son is again. Sort of- <laughs> yeah, my son is sort of straight edge in a way. Yeah, like the virginity rocks thing and right. like that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it wasn't necessarily, I th- I always thought of straight edge more as drug as an alcohol. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it did it have a sex component to it. I mean, I think that usually was the other thing that happened. But yeah, we, we thought of it more, you know, um, yeah, we thought of it more sort of in terms of drugs and alcohol. I wasn't asking about sex. I mean, no, I can, but I wasn't planning on it. Um, it no, that. but my, my, my question, sorry. My question was also, um, did that sense of responsibility ever feel like a burden? Like, did it ever feel heavy? I don't think so because I'm also really good at, like I said, like being social and, and, and having that relate, having relationships, um, whether it was, you know, I, I always had a boyfriend, long-term boyfriends. I was very much like a serial monogamist or, um, 
having uh, uh, parties, uh, just super social. I was I still to this day. I'm like, when are we meeting for book club? When are we going to see the lights at the, you know, at the show around the corner? When are we going to the old movie theater? When are we, you know, like I just love to plan my social time. So I really do live by the work hard, play hard. And I add a third in there, sleep hard. Mm-hmm. I'm a really good sleeper. I'm very talented at sleeping. I think that's just <laughs> as important. Possibly the most important. Um, yeah. I wanted to touch on something that's, you know, kind of been a through line. Um, you know, you mentioned your mom was so young, you know, when she had you. Um, and, you know, you were, you've kind of, you've worked with her essentially your whole life. Whole life. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I wonder sort of, was there a time when you felt like, I don't want that? Or has it always felt pretty copacetic? Well, you know, I, I did definitely go through a period, especially when Sabrina was ending, there was like a lot of pressure on us to figure out the next thing. Um, you know, if we don't find something right away in this industry, you can really fall off. And so, you know, so it it felt that pressure and wasn't sure that we should be working together because, um, she, I was getting married and she was mad at me for getting married, I think, because she never hated any of my other boyfriends. But when I was getting married, she was losing her, basically she called me her travel buddy. She was losing her travel buddy and I've been her best friend her whole life. So like, or my whole life. So I feel like, you know, when I was starting as, as Sabrina's ending and I'm getting married, um, there was a little bit of tension between us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I think as, as would happen in any mother daughter relationship, whether you're working together or not, but I came to realize in my like late twenties, like, who do you trust more than your mom? If you're going to have a production partner, who do you trust more than your mom? In, in most cases, like, right. That's going to look out for you, protect you, have your best interests, tell you the truth, that kind of thing. And you're not really going to there's not that fear of, um, of kind of a big divide. So, I mean, I'm from, for me, it, it worked out really well that we just trust each other. We're honest and open with each other. And we have that relationship. It took a, there was a, there were growing periods in there where it was like, oh, I don't want to say anything to her or my agents didn't want to say anything, or she didn't want to say something, you know, hurting feelings. But now we realize it's just, we, we keep it separate business and family. Um, what's your relationship like with your dad? Is he still back East? He is. Yeah. Um, now he's, uh, breeding oysters with my sister and they also grow algae. They have this whole algae farm. Wow. It's, you would, you would love this. It's like, ins- I don't even understand it. Um, I can eat algae. That's something I can eat. Oh yeah. Well, that's <laughs> well, what they're doing. They're actually right now, kosher, like, it's petitioning, yeah, <laughs> they're petitioning New York to put more algae farms in and like start growing algae in a, a high level to try to clean the oceans and right. trying to do a whole thing with, with algae. Like uh, it's, it's the future, but he is a really, really great guy. That's awesome. And just before I let you go, um, talk a little bit about your podcast and sort of how that fits into life now. I mean, I know you're you're obviously a busy person and you're a mom and it sounds like a very active mom. Um, but this podcast sounds like a lot of fun. Like talk about why you wanted yeah. to do it. You know, I'm always trying to find something that I can do locally so I don't always have to leave. Um, and I moved to Nashville two and a half years ago. And everybody's always been like, don't you want a podcast? Don't you want a podcast? And I was like, I don't know what I would say in it. And I always thought it should be hard hitting politics and religion. And I was like, <laughs> then I was like, you know what? With, that, with the last like six years of politics and religion, I'm like, I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to do Fluffy, which I never wanted to do before. But um, what Women Binge, and we'd love to have you on, Ooh. is bringing in people like yourself that are, you know, familiar faces and just asking you what you're into. I was actually, it, it kind of came about on the set of Young Sheldon because Annie, um, uh, oh, not yeah, Annie Potts and um, Jason Alexander were giving me advice on what shows I should be watching. Because I was like in LA by myself for a few weeks. What should I watch? They were like, you have to watch The Great, and then you have to watch this show, and they have to watch that show. And so they're giving me advice, and I was like, this is awesome. Like, I love talking to people about what show should I watch, what book should I read, what you know, that kind of thing. And during COVID, I feel like my friend group started a spreadsheet of like, hey, if you need a new podcast to listen to, or if you need this or that. So I started an Instagram page, and from that, it spawned into a podcast, which is just fun. Cause it's just, it's just fun, light talk. And you know, we, we just did an episode about like the coronation, which we also tied into queen Charlotte, which also tied into the great, the new season of the great. And we had Joey on to talk about kind of our history, but then all the things he's into. And so we're, we're having a lot of fun with it. I really enjoy it. Awesome. We'll do a quick rapid fire. Yeah, sure. This is rapid fire with Melissa Joan Hart. What was your mother right about? Don't wear too much mascara. <laughs> What was your father right about? You don't need college. <laughs> <laughs> Location that promotes your best mental health. Oof. Um, the mountains. Hmm. Mantra. Do you have a mantra? Or like a saying that you like? I do. It's uh, 
you only regret the things you don't do. Nice. Who's been your best spiritual teacher? Oh, there's been so many through my life, but probably my mother. Hmm. Moment of best intuition. Probably when I, the moment I realized that my, that I'm my children's mother and I don't need to take anyone else's advice. Nice. And who are you most competitive with? Myself mainly, but growing up, probably Sarah Michelle Geller. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much for um, coming to talk to us. And, you know, I feel like there's so many times that I've wanted to ask you all of these things. And I'm really appreciative that we got to do it right here and that I got all my Christmas and clam questions I know. I, answered. You know what? I feel like you're going to have to call me. You're going to have to come to Nashville for my tacky sweater party. <laughs> I just want you to come see how Santa pukes in my house. I mean, I th I'm fascinated by the whole thing. I might take you up on that. Like, it's insane. And then you have to wear your tacky sweater and you can wear a Hanukkah one. Right. I don't have a Christmas one, but I do have Hanukkah no. ones. Wear a Hanukkah. We've had many Hanukkah ones show up. Come on over or just wear a kiss one or whatever, you know. <laughs> come on over and see the whole tacky sweater. I like things with bells. I want things to jingle jangle <laughs> when I walk. So I'll aim for that. Um, it has been so much fun having you on The Breakdown. And, well, I'm so uh, honored that you asked me. I just feel like we should have run into each other so long ago. And this just, it's just so nice to see you. Awesome. And check out What Women Binge. And from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we will see you next time. It's my B. Alex breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down.